from Disney. Flounder, stay out here and watch the sharks. What? This Friday. Has Ariel killed the prince yet? Not killed, kissed, your bird brain. Meet Flounder. Ariel, you know I can't swim that fast. <laughs> Scuttle. Wow, take a wow, wow. You finish? Wow. And Sebastian. I'm a crab on a mission. In the 3D movie event of the summer. When I give the signal, you drop me. Got it. No, you, you, you. Disney's The Little Mermaid. Rated PG. Parental guidance suggested in theaters Friday. Welcome to Mom and Dad are Fighting, Slate's parenting podcast for Thursday, May 25th, the Tooth Fairy Troubles edition. I'm Zach Rosen. I make another podcast. It's called The Best Advice Show, and I'm dad to five-year-old Noah and two-year-old Ami. We live in Detroit. I'm Jamila Lemieux. I'm a writer, contributor to Slate's Care and Feeding Parenting column, and mom to Naima, who is 10, and we live in Los Angeles. Today on the show, we've got an interesting question from a parent who doesn't mind most kid traditions, but just can't seem to get on board with the Tooth Fairy. We're also going to touch base on our week in parenting, and if you're sticking around for Slate Plus, we'll discuss whether school-age kids really need to have their phones on them 24-7. Kids will still find ways to organize fights and pick on each other and be messy as they did when we were in school before cell phones were so rampant, you know, but it's forcing them to talk to each other. You know, I mean, you have the ride home, you have when you get home to be on your phone, you know, and interact with kids that way. I think that face to face time is so important. And I love the idea of these kids getting it back. Yeah. And so if Naima's school comes out with this rule that you cannot bring phones, you're cool with it? I'm totally cool with it. I love it. Yeah, me too. I think it's great. Not only will you get to hear that fun segment, but as a Slate Plus member, you'll get a whole bonus segment every week. Plus, you get to listen to all your favorite Slate podcasts ad-free. It's truly the best way to listen and the best way to support our show. You can sign up for Slate Plus now at slate.com slash mom and dad plus. All right, we're going to jump into triumphs and fails as soon as we get back from this break. Hey, everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids, and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now. Jamila, what's going on with you? Well, I have an update on the friend crisis from last week. Yes, the saga unfolds. Yes. As I mentioned last week, Naima and one of her friends got into it in after school, and it was a big thing, and the girl told Naima she didn't want to be friends anymore, and Naima was heartbroken. Uh, It went on for about a week. Um, The Mm, little girl mm -hmm. continued with her not speaking to Naima, not wanting to talk to her. But finally, the other day, they were in line together and she apologized to Naima. She said her feelings had just been really hurt Mm. and she wanted to be friends again. And so now they are all good. Oh, good. How did that make you feel when you got that news? So relieved. So right. relieved. Every day I had been stressing out about it. And, mm-hmm. you know, I was just waiting for it to turn around. And it did. So I'm glad. I knew it would. But it, it took some time. You made that early intervention of reaching out to the girl's mom. Was that the last? Was that the first and last thing you did to to get involved? Yes. Uh-huh. And then last last week when we spoke, it had just been like a day and you were kind of eagerly waiting for things to get better, as as were, as as all of us were. Um, what did you notice about like the rest of that week when you were kind of in that waiting game? Did the resentment increase, decrease? You know, so we did talk the four of us um, on I think Thursday and try to see you know if the girls could, or maybe it was actually it might have been on Tuesday after dance, you know. We tried to get them to, you know, shake hands and make up. And the other little girl was just really hesitant. You know, she didn't want to talk to Naima. She didn't want to deal with her. And Naima was hurt by it. You know, she cried a few more tears. And then the next stage was anger. She changed the girl's name in her phone to Lying Rat. Oh, my gosh. Was it first yeah. name Lying, last name Rat? or Yes. One? Okay. Yes. But, uh, you know... 
she seemed okay. That was my concern. You know, that mm-hmm. this was going to be taking over her mood and dominating her day. And when I saw that wasn't the case, I felt better. So I just kind of trusted that the two of them would figure things out. And they spend so much time together. They're in this big school production this week. There's this massive school production going on. They've been practicing for months and they're in that. They go to dance together. They go to after school together. So they're constantly around each other. It sounds like this person is like beyond you and um, Naima's dad, like maybe the person that spends the most time with her in her life. She this might is a really be. big deal. Yeah. Yeah. You know, she sees her a lot. She's a grade younger, so they don't see each other all day at school, but they still okay. see each other at school. Okay. Wow. I'm glad that they patched things up. We'll see, you know, yeah. like they're just getting back to being friends again. So we'll see, you know, and I wonder if Naeem will always kind of keep an eye on her, which is sort of what I want her to do. Like, just be mindful, you know, this mm-hmm. person has big feelings and mm-hmm. may surprise you. Mm-hmm. Good. Well, I'm, I'm glad that things are back on track. That's truly a relief. I feel relieved and I'm not even involved. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Zach? What's going on this week? I feel like we made a breakthrough this week, Jamila, and I don't know if it's here to stay, but I hope it is. Noah um, and Ami have been proceeding in their lives at home with kind of reckless abandon. When they both get home from school and reunite, they are so excited and energized that they just kind of go nuts. Um, They kind of just tear through the house, and like the other day they ran up to Ami's room and opened all of his dresser drawers and proceeded to take all of his clothes out and just throw them everywhere like freaking maniacs. I didn't notice um, like for a couple hours. But when I did, I was like, this is not okay. I'm fine that you two have fun together. I'm, I'm thrilled that you have fun together. However, you need to clean this up and you will not be able to um, have your TV time tonight if you don't clean it up. And there was like a ton of stuff, um, all of his clothes. And I just assumed that like, I mean, Ami's too young to really fold his clothes, but Noah is, is nearly six. And I assumed she would have a breakdown and just like ask me to help her, which I probably would have done. But I was surprised when she took it upon herself to just fold all of his clothes. And it took her like, it took her like an hour and a half. Um, At a certain point, I think she got really excited about the idea of doing it herself and, and kind of proving me wrong. She did it. She, she lived with the consequences and she proved that um, she can, uh, she can hold her own domestically and uh, I haven't asked her since to put the clothes away, but now that I'm telling you the story, I feel like because I know that she can, maybe she should because it really instilled some real uh, sense of accomplishment and responsibility in her. So I was I was delightfully surprised and um, just super impressed that she was steadfast enough to see see it all through because he's got a lot of clothes. That is really impressive. She had no entertainment. She just sat there and folded clothes. No, I even offered to put a podcast on. She's like, no, nope, it's okay. Ami was sitting there keeping her company for part of it. But no, I think I think she just, uh, you know, treated it like a really new challenge, which, which it was. That's very cool. Does Naima do any laundry yet? No. Yeah. I don't know if it was a flash in the pan moment where, like, I just got lucky. But I'm going to persist to see if she'll do that again um but i'll keep you posted please do well on that note we're going to take another quick break see you back here for our listener question we're back and joined now by willa paskin host of slate's incredible podcast decoder ring they recently released a truly fascinating episode about the origins of the tooth fairy as a childhood ritual its durability, and its remarkable resistance to commercialization. And it's great because Willa, we think, is the perfect person to help us answer today's question about the Tooth Fairy from our listener. And we're going to get into that. Willa, welcome. Hi. Hi, hi, hi. 
I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Hi. Good. We're, we're so excited to have you. And before we get into the listener question, I just want to kind of wet the palate of listeners who have not yet listened to your uh, recent decoder ring episode. So just tell us a little bit about why why it is that the Tooth Fairy has resisted commercialization for so long. <laughs> well, it is. It's sort of um. so my, I have two girls who are six and eight. And um, mm-hmm. my husband came home one night actually from being out for drinks with a friend who's also a dad. And he was like, isn't it so weird? <laughs> like, the Tooth Fairy's still weird? Like, isn't it weird that someone hasn't figured out how to, like, make a lot of money on the Tooth Fairy? And as soon as he said it, I was like, that is weird. And I, you know what would be amazing? If someone tried to do it. I'm going to Google it in the morning. <laughs> and then, like, I Google it, and lo and behold, if you Google commercialization of the Tooth Fairy, a whole story comes up that is part of the episode that we ended up doing, but not all of it. And it just seemed like it's such a low-hanging fruit, right? Like, what makes it so special that it could have, could have resisted all of this? And I think uh, I think the answer um, is kind of that it's just so intimate and domestic, actually. Um, mm-hmm. And also that no one's come up with, like, a really good idea for it yet. Maybe no one's tried. <laughs> Maybe the answer is that no one's tried. But one of the other answers, I think, is that, you know, it's like, it's such, um, it's so bespoke. It's like... Mm-hmm. Every family Unla- does unlike it. Unlike Santa, for instance. Yeah. Like we can picture and, Santa, but we can't all picture the same tooth fairy. And I, I think that there, there is some, you know, alternate future or future for this world that we live in where someone figures out how to Santa the tooth fairy. Uh, but it hasn't happened. And that's so great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, th- I mean, more I think of your tooth fairy reporting is going to come out as you help us answer this question. So, so let's go to the listener question. Okay, great. Hi, Mom and Dad. My oldest is in kindergarten, and last night she came into our room right after she brushed her teeth. She opened her little mouth and started wiggling her bottom tooth. Is it terrible of me to say I've been dreading this day? I typically don't mind little kid traditions. Santa? Sure, that's fun. Leprechauns playing pranks on St. Patrick's Day? Why not? But there's something that I just don't like about the tooth fairy. Even when I was little, I didn't like the idea of trading my bones for money. What was a little fairy going to do with my bones anyways? I'm not sure I wanted to know. Also, should I be adjusting for inflation? Do kids compare dollar amounts? Ugh. I'm not a night person, nor am I stealthy. I don't want to participate in this thing and then ruin it because I forgot to get the stupid tooth. Plus, I've got three kids. If they lose 20 teeth each, that's 60 nights. Am I being a Scrooge or is there a better way we can do this? Signed, Refusing My Wings. Tooth Fairy Scholar Willa Paskin, what do you say? I was just say up front that like I don't personally believe in tooth fairy inflation and like mm-hmm. I got a dollar and my kids get a dollar and I sleep great at night about that. I'm like, it's cool. They're little. Just just that's like a very small point. Yeah. Um, hmm. You, if you see guys seen, I saw this after the episode went up, but there's this Kimmy Schmidt bit from Titus Burgess where he <laughs> talks about how teeth are bones outside of your face um, and it's incredible and when you maybe you can play it your teeth are bones that live outside they hang from your lips like bats oh outside bones outside bones never forget your teeth are outside okay bones. i think bones basically if you don't have ish with santa claus or the leprechauns of saint patrick's day then um Probably like you just get over it and do the tooth fairy stuff. I mean, I don't think it's a big deal either way. And I think that there are people who have like reservations about lying to their children, for example. Um, And I think there's lots of things you can do uh, instead of having a tooth fairy. I think the thing that's sort of nice about a ritual of some kind around tooth losing is that I think it actually... um, like, I know my littlest, when she was losing her teeth, she actually was kind of, like, scared about it. It, it actually scared her a little because mm. it's true. Your bones don't just, like, fall out. Um, and it's not that the tooth fairy really helped her be less scared. But there was something about ritualizing it that felt it, that made me feel like um, there was going to be a path to making her, like, less freaked out. Um, and in the episode, I get at this, I think a lot of the rituals about this stuff are for us parents um it's mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. the tooth losing is so keeping your kid very little by telling them this make-believe story even as they are physically in the act of growing up that's why they're losing their teeth um and i think that's part of the reason it's so poignant to us grown-ups but if it's not poignant to you you know 
I think like rituals are fun and it's nice to have family rituals and there's probably like a different version to do um, that maybe doesn't involve, you know, uh, money. Maybe it doesn't involve you having to remember to crawl in every, not like every 60 nights uh, in your future. I think those are fine. I, 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 You know, it's like that's also what's cool about the Tooth Fairy. Uh, it's really between you and your family. So no one's going to like give you a hard time. But it probably will come up and so you should. You know, I mean, I tell my kids Santa's not real all the time um, because we're Jewish. <laughs> so mm. it's like you can, you can do what Same. you want. That yeah. was that was like a was that an all over the place answer? No, I just that's feel great. like there's that's yeah, there's just like no, I don't know, there's no rules. You know, there really aren't any rules. You don't mm-hmm. have to do it. What do you think, Jamila? I'm a tooth fairy Santa Claus girl. You know, I think these are sweet rituals. Um, I mean, obviously, if you're Jewish, I understand why you're not dealing with Santa Claus, but. Um, As far as the tooth fairy goes, you know, it can just be a dollar. It doesn't have to be a lot of money. Some kids get more. It's fine. I think a dollar is still completely acceptable. I know you're not a night person, but I'm pretty sure your child goes to sleep earlier (laughs) than you. You know, this is not the hardest thing to do, to slip a dollar under a kid's pillow. If you like, you all can... Maybe designate a place in the room, maybe on a nightstand instead of under the pillow so you don't have to sneak under your child's body to get the money there. But I say just go for it. It, you know, like it does help kids make peace with this weird thing that is happening to their faces, you know, where they're literally losing bones. You know, it is weird. It is a little creepy, Um, but this gives them something to look forward to. Also, you definitely don't have to do money if that's a the sticking point. You could do stickers. You could do what you know. I mean, you can do anything you want. You could do a drawing. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't have to be the money. Um, and also, I would just say, as someone who has forgotten occasionally, like they are when they're little, like they're not that slick. Like you know, yep. you could just you come in in the morning and be like, oh, I think you just didn't look close enough. You know, like yep. they're yep. very the thing. The thing that I've been the most surprised about when I really thought about it, like thinking about the tooth fairy, is how much kids are participating in the belief. Like they are really wanting to believe for a long time and they will give you a lot of leeway uh, to continue believing. It's like a shared make-believe. And so, you know, the tooth fairy could have just been like, oops, accidentally dropped it over here. Look at that. <laughs> there's there's the thing I forgot to put last night. It'll work. Yeah. And like you were saying, Willa, this is a bespoke thing that we can make our own and therefore like make your own tradition of once you wake up in the morning, you know, uh, put your whatever, put the tooth under your cereal bowl. Like, you know, you can do something where you don't necessarily have to wake up in the middle of the night. In fact, uh, Elizabeth, our co-host, who's in Peru right now, her kid just lost a tooth. And the tradition that we learned in Peru is to throw your fallen tooth on the roof. So like, just do something that is more convenient for you and actually would probably be pretty fun for your kid to participate in if you don't want to do the the tradish, the American tradish um, under the pillow thing. Yeah, there's lots of those. Almost all cultures have some kind of tradition about it because it's it is actually like a, a thing that's happening <laughs> that's of note. What were some of your favorite international uh, tooth customs that you uncovered? Throwing your tooth on the roof is like the most um common that's not like a magical creature coming um to take your tooth which there you know we have the fairy and then in a lot of um spanish-speaking countries and sort of french countries too uh there's the tooth mouse el raton perez who is a cute little mouse who comes and takes your tooth there's Mm -hmm. bury there's a lot of teeth burial there's um there's you trade it with animals that have good teeth you know like the something that has strong teeth will take your tooth you can throw it in the sun you can throw it in the fire you know, there's lots of different different ways of thinking about it as like sort of this indestructible, destructible thing. Yeah. Jamila, what do you guys do at your house? Um, I Well, Naima is now post-Tooth Fairy. We had the conversation a couple months ago about Tooth Fairy and Santa. She confronted me with evidence and I told <laughs> it. I was like, okay, it's time to just be honest with you. But what I used to do is she'd put her tooth under a pillow and I'd put a dollar there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That reminds me one of the moments in your episode, Willa, that kind of choked me up that I found profound is this idea of what comes after the disappointment of finding out the truth. Cause we talk a lot about the reveal of our kids finding out and Oh God, what are we going to do once they find out? But talk about what, what comes after that? Well, 
I mean, <laughs> yes, that's like the end of the episode. And it was sort of like it was something I hadn't thought about before I was really thinking about it. But uh, right. It's like we think of it as this ritual that's about keep, you know, it's like magical and fantastical and it's keeping your kids little and and um, believing. And that's all true. But this moment um, when you realize that the grownups you love most are keeping something from you. I sort of started to think it's like, oh, this is like an incredible test run for like the whole rest of your life and not in a bad way, right? Like having this moment where you realize your parents have done something um, because they love you so much, but it might not be the thing that you would do. I think that's like, like, welcome to the future. (laughs) Um, And it's almost like a ritualized way to have that conversation right like your daughter coming to you with the evidence like it's she's gonna be coming to you with evidence about lots of things probably you know and it's like and it's like this it's sort of like it's like one of the first ones but it's it's about growing up right like that's what losing your teeth is about and so we think about it as like keeping them little but I think stopping believing in these sort of magical fictional beings is as really is like as much a part of why they're valuable as all the stuff that came before that seems so much nicer but uh you know is is actually a fantasy and having to sort of navigate these more complicated why people do the things they do and what they keep from you and what they don't um it's like it seems like a baby step into that that really deep end of being an adult i think back to to these bubbles bursting when i was a kid um like do you remember when you found out jamila that that santa wasn't real uh i do i was also around 10 um i think my best friend had like been trying to tell me and i was just like whatever but i had done the math like i knew that i was getting presents from both santa and from mom on christmas and so if there was no santa would that mean less presents you know, so I held on as long as I possibly could. <laughs> I used to have a friend saved in my phone as Santa, and I would call him for backup when my daughter was acting out. <laughs> I did this for years. He'd, oh, Naima, you know, I hear you're not behaving well. Is that true? Like, he'd put on, he's a comedian, and he'd put on a whole performance for her until one day I think Naima FaceTimed him and he picked up. And I was like, really? <laughs> Really? Did she still believe after that? Or was she like... She still believed in Santa. You know, she just didn't believe I had his phone number anymore. (laughs) You see, that's the kind of stuff, like, that's right. Like, she was like, I'm going to figure out how this makes sense for me still. Yeah. Yeah. This is actually like, there's, um, I spoke to her for the episode, but I didn't, I didn't end up including her, is that if you email the tooth fairy at Gmail, there is a woman who will respond to you. <laughs> some, some. Wow. What? Just yeah. the tooth fairy at gmail.com? Yeah. She is in the dental profession. And she basically got a very early Gmail, like her partner got it for her. And she didn't think about, like it wasn't supposed to be because she was the tooth fairy. And then she started getting these emails. She's from India, so she didn't grow up with the tooth fairy. But then she understood exactly what it was. And she she gets a lot of them. So she doesn't always reply, but she, she responds to a bunch of them. And she gets a lot of like, excuse, you know, like a lot of people will write the tooth fairy to be like, I lost this tooth. Will you still come? Or like, I swallowed mm-hmm. it. Or like, is it OK? Mm-hmm. Like par- parents just being like, it's fine. Don't worry. You know? Yeah. <laughs> we'll send a note. We'll email her. That's Did, I mean, Willa, you learned a lot uh, about the tooth fairy and, and kind of myth and culture in this episode. Is there is there just one final idea you want to share with us about how we might consider thinking about this uh, weird bespoke tradition? No, I guess I just, like, think it's cool to think about it. Like, it's just a hiding in plain sight, and it's so strange. I mean, teeth are like that in kind of general. There's, like, a lot of weirdness about teeth, um, which I think actually why the person seeking advice, like, that was sort of the premise, was, like, ugh, teeth, which I think we can all understand a little bit. Um, But it's just so, I'm always so delighted when you, like, do stumble on the thing that you just hadn't noticed, and then you notice it, and you're like, What? We're so strange. Like you just, it, it makes you feel like, um, like an anthropologist, you know, <laughs> where you're like, oh, we do, we're, wow, culture is crazy. And so is ours. And people do amazing things. And like, the tooth fairy's still here. Whoa, cool. <laughs> well, uh, refusing my wings, thanks for writing in. Please keep us posted on what you decide to do. I know a lot of you out there listening have some great traditions and we'd love to hear them. 
drop us a line at momanddad at slate.com or leave us a voicemail at 646-357-9318 and definitely listen to uh, the recent episode of Decodering about this and you will get a much, much richer understanding of of why we do the things we do as, as a people, as Americans, as parents. But that's our show. Please subscribe, leave us a rating and review and tell your friends. That really helps us grow our little community. This episode of Mom and Dad Are Fighting is produced by Rosemary Belson and Maura Curry. Alicia Montgomery is VP of Slate Audio. I'm Zach Rosen. And I'm Jamila Lemieux. Thank you for listening. 